Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome uh, to How to Win Webinars, number eight. What's today's about, Steve? It's about changing minds, which uh, is also about changing behavior, which we'll get into. Um, but we, we're, we're moving out of the fundamentals. We're getting into the, the uh, advanced coursework here. This is 201. Uh, yeah. So if you want to go back and review any of the old webinars, they're all online for now. Foundational. Uh, they're not old. They're foundational. The foundational, yeah. I didn't, did I say old? Wow. <laughs> um, so you can go back and, and review them. Um, it's not important. You're not going to not understand something today because you didn't watch them. But they're there. And um, yeah, this is, this is more advanced level. So welcome. You're all advanced now. So, Steve, can I tell you what's really pissing me off? Yeah. Like, I'm going to these meetings, right, and everybody, like, in the hallway is like, oh, I'm so angry about Trump. I'm so angry about Trump. I'm so pissed off. So much more. And I go to these meetings, like, about making the school a sanctuary, and, like, none of those people show up. And I've told really? them about it, and I've, like, said, okay, here's where the meeting is. I sometimes even send reminder notes and stuff like that. And I, it makes me crazy. Oh, man. Okay. Well, you. This will help. This will help. Um, so, should we? Should we just get into it then? I think we should just get into it. But I want to know how this is going to help, because I'm really mad at these people. Ah. <laughs> uh, okay. So, getting mad at your colleagues is not going to help, right? Like that. That. Uh, that anger and bitterness. We, okay. Okay. I'm not mad. I'm not I'm a big fan of of the burned out bitter activists. You, you know, I'm, I'm disappointed in their idiocy. <laughs> yeah, but there's some judgment there, right? Like these people are fools. They're idiots. They're not coming. Why are they? Yeah. yeah right. They're fools. You are they're, better than them. they're fools. They're idiots. They're not coming. You're right. Yeah. So, so what's your point? I don't get it. But that's not going to help either, right? Like being bitter and angry at other people that you're trying to help, that you're supposed to work together with, not good. Okay, so how, how do we get out of this place? Because actually I was really speaking from real experience, but I was also playing on the part, obviously, um, is that we often, you know, when we approach people, or when we're trying to reach an audience with our creative work, when we're trying to speak to people as activists, we often get really frustrated because they don't listen. Um, they don't do what we want them to do, or they actually will read the very same thing that we're reading and get a completely different, you know, message out of it, or do something absolutely contrary to what we think they should be doing. Yeah. And, the, yep. The way I describe it is, why are the people I'm trying to help continue to make these poor decisions? Exactly. And then you end up getting mad at the people that you're trying to help or the people you're trying to work with. Exactly. So what's, we're going to do something today to kind of help you think this through. Um, uh, we're going to actually do what we often do at the C4AA, which is we draw from very different sorts of literature. Um, last week, we actually drew from behavioral psychology, was it? Uh, yeah, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, next week, we're going to actually draw from popular culture and look at uh, hit movies and hit television. And this week, we're actually going to draw from marketing. Like those, I don't know if anybody took any marketing courses um, or business courses, but what we're going to be talking about is very familiar, but we're going to move it slightly to a different direction, indefinitely for a different purpose. But yeah. Before that, Steve, you got something you want to do with us, right? Yes. This is something that we do in our workshops. And what I'll do, and I'll come out and uh, have a coin and a hundred dollars or a hundred euros or you know a significant amount of money in whatever currency of the country that we're in and I try to make a bet with people and the bet is um, I say we're gonna flip a coin and if it lands on heads I think let me make sure I get this right because I wrote it down you get this hundred dollars and if it lands on tails you give me a hundred dollars and I try to get people to bet with me now, of course, I would love to do that with all of you, but, you know, I just don't, I'd have to mail a lot of checks and get all your addresses and everything. So what we're going to do instead is do this as a poll in the webinar, so webinar software. And I want you to imagine, like, this is a real bet. 
you have $100 at stake, and we're going to flip a coin. Would you take this bet? So here's the poll. And uh, think it through. If this was real, what would you do? All right, so we got almost half the people voting. I won't say what the answer is because I don't want that to influence it. Can you see the results, Steve? I cannot see the results. I can't even vote. I was going to fix the vote, and I can't. <laughs> if you look at the polls you'll, uh, and open that up, you'll see. All right, so we've got almost everybody voting, 85%. And I will tell you the results now. Um, I'm going to close the poll here. Last chance to vote here. Three, two, oh man, you got, now people are jumping in. Okay, so I'm going to close the poll. So, the result. 90% of you said you did not want to take the bet. Only 10% of you said. So Whoa. let's see if we can get more people to take this bet. Um, just for fun, I'm going to change the terms a bit. Okay, make it, yeah, we got, we got to sweeten the pot. All right, so in this case, I'm going to flip the coin. You would get $150. I would pay you $150 if it lands on heads. Uh, if it lands on tails, you still have to give $100. So let's, uh, let's do another poll, right? This all makes sense. Heads, you get $150. Tails, I get your $100. Let's see how people do here. So go ahead and vote. Votes are streaming in. You guys are on it this time. We're already at 70% of people voting. Some of you might be uh, weighing it out. It's a tough call. Okay, so now we've got 88% of people voting. I'm going to close it in a few seconds here. 91, 3, 2, 1. And we've got more people voting. We've got 65% said no, they wouldn't. Not more people voting. More different result here. 35% said yes. So um, I still want to uh, see what happens if we change this up a little bit. Sweeten so the pot. Sweeten the pot. Yeah. Let's try this. Now, again, I want you to imagine this is real. Heads, you get my $150. Tails, you lose $50. Okay? So let's see how this will go, and I'll open up the poll. So this is 50-50 chance of winning $150 or losing 50 of your hard-earned real American or Euros or wherever you are. This is your paycheck. So we got 70% of people voting. Ah. <laughs> this is funny. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is this works different than it does in person. I think uh -huh. we got one more. So okay, so, anonymity. Now, some of you are really weighing this out. Um, I'm going to close the polls in three seconds. Two, one, and it really shifted. Look at this. <laughs> wow! Wow! That's that usually doesn't happen in our workshops, but before we explain it, yeah, but it's it's. I got I got one more. I think I think it's because it's anonymous, but let's see what happens in the next. And I'm not waving real money in front of you, so let's right. let's just make this a little bit more real. So and actually, this I, time we're actually going to follow up on this because we have your email addresses. <laughs> so if you make this bet, we're going to take you on it. Okay. Okay. So um, I wonder if some of them have been in our workshops. This is how That's we bankroll the center, actually. Like they're, they're, they're already know. So OK, I'm adding a zero. This is serious now. Flip a coin, you get $1,500. But if it lands on tails, and it's a 50-50 chance that it lands on tails, you lose $500. So think about this. Where are you going to get the money? You go into the bank and withdrawing this money or writing me a check for $500 because this landed on tails. And uh, let's see how this goes. So get your answers in. All right. Man, in six seconds, we have half people voting. Ooh. 
Interesting. Very interesting. I, I want to get to 90%, so I, get, I think some people are agonizing over this. 50-50 chance. You win 1,500 or you lose 50. 500, sorry. <laughs> that would be a really great bet. Yeah, that would, that would drive it, the numbers up. Okay, so I'm going to close the poll in a few seconds here. Three, two, one, and um, let's look at the results this time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> see? The threat of tracking people down and making the bet real. <laughs> I think that's what did it. All right, so this is... Um, this is fun, yeah. but this actually isn't how it works out in, uh, as we do the workshop. Well, it, it, the, the final one does. Yeah. 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 It's, it's that once, once we raise the stakes and remove the anonymity <laughs> and threaten to actually do this, yeah. uh, it actually conformed to pretty much what happens in workshops. And again, we've done this with probably a thousand people now from all over different parts of the world. And with the exception of that outlier of the third one, that sort of rate is pretty much the same. There's always a few people who are willing to do that 50-50 wager, right? Yeah. And then as we sweeten the pot, it gets a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better, but there's still many more people who would not take that bet than actually people that are going to sign on and say, I will do that bet. Now... Yeah. Yeah, so we've always, there's always like here we've got 16% of you that are real risk takers. So congratulations, you folks are uh, you're, you're actually smart because that that last bet is mathematically a really good bet. If if someone ever offers you that bet, you should take it because you stand to gain uh, three times more than you lose, and it's a 50/50 chance, which are it's very good. Right, so if you can take that bet over and over again, your odds increase uh, in the as you go in the possibility of you making money. As I'm saying this, it might not make sense because you're probably thinking like, no, you know, I still could lose five hundred dollars. Like, what are you talking about? How is that a good bet? And that's the that's the point of what we're doing. And and this this research has been done in labs. We're sort of like mimicking an experiment that's a social science experiment. And what it tests for is something called loss aversion. And loss aversion is the idea that we're uncomfortable with losing things even when we stand to gain a lot more. In the lab test, they would actually give people $100 at the beginning and then try to get them to bet on a coin flip to lose the $100. Mm -hmm. And it's, we all know this from sort of personal experience. We tend to dwell on those things that could go wrong rather than those possibilities that could go right, or what we have to lose in doing a new something or another versus what we might have to gain. Yeah, and it, I was thinking about this today as I was putting this together, is that what's happening right now in the United States is an interesting case of loss aversion because I think a lot of people are really motivated and upset because of the thinking about what they have to lose. Yeah, I agree. Um, but it works in other ways, too. And what we were talking before about and have been talking about is um, behavior change. So before we go on with this, um, the reason that we have you do it and sort of experience it, the why, why we did the poll, why when I do the workshops I pull out cash and start waving it around in the room, is because you need to experience it. Um, because it, you, if I told you, like, yeah, in this case, people in labs, you know, like, well, people in labs might do that, but not me. You know, like, I, I know better. I'm smarter than that. Um, but when, when it's actually happening, you're, you feel it in a different way. Um, Gonzalo has a question is, are we going to flip the coin now? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't have a coin. I might. Let's just see how much money I would have made. Or lost. You know what I have? Bankrupt, you could have bankrupted the center. I think I have an old coin battery. No. Oh, yeah, I do. All right. Should we see what would happen? Yeah. Now you find out. Is everyone getting nervous? Wait. Heads is the, that we get the money. Tails. Let me go back to the money, right? Heads. Yeah, we make a bunch of money. Well, from the people that were willing to bet, not everyone was. All right, so positive, I'm using an old coin battery. Positive is going to be 
heads, negative is tails. Here we go. Because positive, I make money, right? No, I lose money. Damn. Okay. Here we go. Blah. Oh, it was tails. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. Okay. We, 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 would have, we wouldn't have to do fundraising this year. I know. Okay. <laughs> now you know. All right. So um, let's go back. You, would have lo you had a lot to lose. <laughs> yeah. Turns so out. Basically, we all have this. We're, all human beings are loss averse. It's not just special people. It's not smart people that aren't and, and foolish people that are. Uh, it's not like a class or regional thing or a cultural thing. It's a human thing. Um, so that's that. So let's go back to um, our first webinar. And we were talking about what we're, what we're trying to achieve and, and sort of rules of thumb for creating change. And one of those rules of thumb was to think in terms of behavior. I'm pretty sure we did this in the first one, right? So it's thinking in terms of behavior instead of um, raising awareness or starting a conversation. And so that's where, what we're working towards is behaviors, behaviors being visible physical action, something someone's doing. They're voting, they're calling, they're showing up at a march. They're, what, is the, what does it look like when they're doing this thing? Yeah. Right? And that's not, not to say that changing people's mind and raising awareness isn't important, but it's a step towards something else because people can have their awareness raised but do nothing about it, and if they do nothing about it, then nothing changes. Exactly. So if we're thinking in terms of behavior, then we can categorize things and we can look at it closer. So how do we get people to move from their old or current behavior to a new behavior? And this is where your marketing 101 class that you might have taken at some point, or a business class you might have taken, sort of kicks in. Um, and one of the things you learn in any sort of business class is a cost-benefit analysis. Um, or organizational class, you do a cost-benefit analysis. That is essentially what we're interested in doing is trying to figure out what is the costs of people changing into a new behavior and what are the benefits and also the benefits and the costs of staying in the old behavior. Um, and we like to actually flip it around a bit, and so we do benefits and costs, but it's still basically the same thing. I think Steve has disappeared because he's hooking up some amazing bit of technology that will soon flash on your screen, and we're going to work through a cost-benefit analysis in order to try to figure out... There we go. Woo! So in order to try to figure out why people do things that they do or don't do things that they don't do. So we're going to start with a really simple example. Um, and I'm going to we go back to the meeting thing. What's that? Right. Let's yeah, try I'm, to go, I'm, I'm going to go back to, that, to the meeting, um, which is here are my colleagues, right? Um, or they could be members of your community or people you know or what have you. And you're trying to get them to go to a meeting. Um, and it's a meeting. It's your local indivisible meeting or a local meeting of community artists that are really working hard on transforming society in a post-Trump America. And you know, you go to that first meeting and all these people you talk to just don't show up. Um, they said they were angry, they were mad, and they wanted to do something, and you made a little simple ask and they didn't show up. Um, and so the question is, is like, why? Now, the first thing I think, they're idiots, okay? They don't really want to change anything. And I'm disgusted by them, blah, blah, blah. Not helpful. Not helpful because it doesn't help us understand who these people are and how to get them to change their behaviors. It just is condemning them and perhaps making us feel good about ourselves. We're the type of people, right? So what we want to do now is kind of work through this cost-benefit analysis sheet. So we're going to start up in the upper left-hand corner. And what we want you to do is write in, your com in the comment section, in the chat section, what are the benefits of not going to a meeting? What do I gain by not bothering to show up? Yeah. So give it some thought. Write this down. And just, this is an open brainstorm session. When you do it, 
Um, it's always best to do it with other people because people can just kind of throw ideas out there. And what's going to happen is we throw them out there. Steve is going to write them up in uh, on our chart. So, so I, I I see one here from Casey, which is pretty awesome. Which is um, I can binge watch Netflix. There you go. Okay, good one. Which basically means like you can do whatever you want. I'll say um, I relate to this. So I was supposed to come down and sit side by side with you today. And I woke up and I just was tired from mm -hmm. shoveling snow last night. Um, so you can binge watch Netflix. You can kind of spend your time the way that you want, relax, and like not show up in a meeting. Um, right. Leslie no says no confrontation. That's great, and particularly meetings are sometimes just exhausting, right? You know, was it Oscar Wilde once said he'd be a socialist, except it took up too many free evenings. Um, and we could <laughs> add to that, you know, yeah, I'd be a political activist, except I just hate being in a room with a bunch of other cantankerous political activists. Yeah. Um, well, oh, really Leslie got another good one, too, which is don't have to face reality. Continue on blissfully unaware. That's great. Yeah. And these are... Um, you know, both of these are kind of, or the confrontation thing is a potential. It's not, we don't know that it's going to happen. Right. But if you don't go, you don't have to deal with it. Yeah. Bliss fixed, you know, Netflix doesn't challenge you. So Katie had um, no pressure to confront discomfort. Okay. That idea that you stay within your cocoon, right? And everything's okay. You got your Netflix. Maybe you have, you know, some snack product. And... You know, you don't have to go into this outside world, which all of a sudden raises all of this these issues. Um, wow, Beth, Beth's got a good one. Yeah. I can make art. I'm gonna write it, yeah, I I can do what I want. I can do other stuff. Um, Helm says not having to endure a lot of talk with no action. <laughs> Said by someone who's gone to a lot of meetings, no doubt. Um, let's see, too much responsibility. Yeah, so yeah. benefit would be less responsibility, right? Exactly. You're not taking on responsibility. Right. Good. So we could keep going on this. Um, and if we were to do this for real, we'd spend like 15, 20 minutes just kind of throwing as much stuff out there. But let's shift over to the possible benefits of actually going to a meeting. Like what are the things you would gain or a person would gain? My colleagues, your friends, your coworkers, people in your community, what would they gain by going to this meeting? I think I could get this started. Okay. I would I would see some friends maybe. Right? Yeah. Like if I was there, you and I would be side by side. I'd be able, we'd be hanging out. Mm -hmm. So the deep friends and um, like interpersonal good feelings. Mm -hmm. So if anybody has any ideas, just type those in. Uh, sense of belonging, I see. Yep, yeah, that's a good one. A yeah, you're part of a group, right? You're not alone in facing all this stuff, which can be uh, isolating. Yep. Yeah. Get an idea of what to actually do. Yeah. I'm going to say agency. That's the fancy, fancy sociological term for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sleep better at night. That's a good one. <laughs> no, I mean, that's true. It's, it's like sometimes I don't go to meetings because I actually want to binge watch Netflix. And I actually feel guilty. <laughs> um, I'm just going to write less guilt. Here's a good one. Tell me. Permission to feel smug, comma, and proud. <laughs> uh, righteousness. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's something about, it's like feeling like you've done your duty or something. I'm just going to write proud. <laughs> yeah. I kind of like smug, but. We'll leave, yeah, we'll leave that. <laughs> um, oh, here's my, uh, learn something new about the issue or cause. Yeah. 
It's educational. That's nice. Ah, here's a, another one which kind of works with the um, the fear of people are just going to do all talk, no action, right? Which is you actually where did it go? Um, do, 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 do. You're able to figure out what to do, get an idea of what to actually do. Mm. I have that one up here. Oh, you do? Yeah, yeah, with the agency, right? Oh, okay, that was this fancy sociological term. Exactly. Uh, what about, let's see, feeling, the feeling of doing something good for yourself and community. I think that's like, um, yeah, feel good, right? You can, you're mm -hmm. doing your part. And here's one, which is be able to talk your mind. The sense of like, and it goes back to that community, is like when you're in a meeting with like-minded people, particularly if you're in an area or in a workplace where people don't share your political views, you can actually finally tell people what you think. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. Something, something, you know, for all of the, the talk about that people are stuck in bubbles, sometimes the bubble is comforting. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a neighbor down the street who has like a big Trump sign in his lawn, and it's really nice to talk to other neighbors who are like, "Yeah, that guy." <laughs> you know. So this someone put, "Why is this all individually focused?" Which I think is a really interesting question, and mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be individually focused. One of the things, the benefits of this new behavior going to meeting, is you can change the world. We can change the world. Mm -hmm. That is, is that through collective action, we actually have a chance of doing something. That's good. I think we automatically think about it individually because we are talking about individual behavior of how to get an individual to go to a meeting. But I think what I like about that question is in getting an individual to go to a meeting, they start to feel as part of a community. And that community can therefore transform the world. So I like really, that. one of the benefits is power. Yeah. Exactly. All right. We, again, we could go for a long time on this, but let's switch off to costs. Okay. And yes. this is a this is where we want to think about what are the costs of doing nothing. Going back to the bottom left hand corner, the cost of old behavior not showing up at a meeting. What are the costs to that? So if you have ideas about the costs of doing nothing, like what are the downsides of doing nothing, throw them up in the chat. Regret, that's a good one. Ooh, that's like really that. good. I should have done something. There was a moment in history in which people were asked to step up and I didn't do it. I wasn't one of those people. I see um, Martha says nothing changes. Yeah. Or it's like you're out of control. Maybe things change, yeah. but you're not. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> There's a great one. Trump burns down the world as we know it. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm just going to write Trump apocalypse. Yeah, that's a good one. How did you spell that? I'm going to spell it wrong. Trump, oh, that was pretty good. It's a made up word. I can spell it however I want. Yeah, I actually think that is how you can Trump Ocaplex. You got a little accent on the E there. It's French now. Yeah, there you go. Um, Joey's got, uh, I have to swallow all the anger and deal with it myself. Ooh, yeah. That's great. Long term harm there. Well, and also, I, what I like about that is this idea of dealing it with myself. That idea that I have to bottle it up. And there's no sort of, uh, I think someone used this word elsewhere, uh, catharsis. You don't have a sense of actually doing something, letting go of some of that, and sharing it with others. Um, I see Leslie, or no, uh, Marnie said too, the result of these things is just a general sense of despair. Yeah, exactly. That's good. They, individually, I just, uh, I don't want to get up in the morning. And then Leslie adds a more social one, which is loss of basic civil rights. The fact is that people don't show up and do things. That is a cost. Lose their civil rights. That's a big cost. Uh, and Kalmia had a nice one, feeling left out. K 
can't tell you how many people after a social movement has, you know, peaked and passed are like, oh man, if I had just been around during the civil rights movement, I would have joined, okay? Or Occupy, that would have been awesome. I should have done that. Or Black Lives Matter, I really should go out in the street. Um, and then that feeling of like, I, I wasn't part of history. Yeah. Uh, cost I, of missing a meeting, loss of social capital. I like that. Your friends who did show up at the meeting are going to look at you and like say, hey, you didn't show up at the meeting. What's up with that? Um, Casey there. Did you see Casey's? Hold on. Not, we got to scroll. Yeah. Not supporting my um, LGBTQIA friends, people of color. Yeah. I think there's something there about, like, I feel like I could do something, even more guilt, because you have, um, you knew you could do something. Yeah, yeah. All right, we, again, we could keep going with this, and these are coming in fast and furious, which is awesome. Um, now we're going to do the final part, which is the costs of the new behavior, because no matter how righteous and wonderful this new behavior is, going to a meeting, getting involved, standing up, it also has costs. And so we want to think about what costs are there for going to a meeting, getting involved. Okay, I'm going to, just to get us started, use my example from today, which is I would have spent time on the train. Yeah, time. Uh, and, it, and money on a train ticket. Yeah. Those are always easy costs, right? Those ones are kind of obvious, but sometimes we forget. Maybe for someone else it would be a babysitter, right? Or like where that, where for you to come out at a meeting that night yeah. it would literally cost you money. Yeah. And I'm going to add one too, which is if you look over to benefits of the old behavior, it's one of the ways to think about costs of the new behavior. And I'm thinking about blissfully unaware which is, there's no more bliss of ignorance. Yeah. You can't say Painfully I didn't, aware. I didn't know what, what? Painfully aware. Yeah, exactly. I, I, you can't say, I didn't know what to do. Because yeah. if you went to the meeting, you would know what to do. <laughs> ah, here's, Patrick has a nice one, loss of your anonymity. Mm -hmm. you're, you're putting yourself out there. There's what I think, there's what I believe. And, you know, in some communities, in some places, you know, it's a great, actually, increase of social capital to be show, see yourself at a meeting. In some places, it means you get shunned. Yeah. Um, less time with loved ones. That's good. That's what I always, I do this benefit, cost-benefit analysis every time I'm invited to a meeting in the evenings about, you know, do I want to hang out with my kids, or do I actually want to go to this meeting? The kids often win, actually, <laughs> partially because I don't like evening meetings, but um, it's something I think about. Oh, here's, here's a nice one. Have to manage social anxieties. I think that's a great one. Like, I'm fundamentally an introvert. You know, I go to meetings because it's the right thing to do, but I am not comfortable at meetings. <laughs> yeah. Or you have to deal with other people's social anxieties. Yeah, depends on how you <laughs> want to read that one. Um, yeah, people in meetings I've been at not, are not always the best at uh, making everyone else feel comfortable either. It's true. Uh, Katie's got a good one, accountability. And again, it's like you, you go to a meeting every time I go to a meeting. I went to one last week, right? And you know what happened? It led to something I have to do today at 2 o'clock, <laughs> which will lead to something work. I have to do. It's all of a sudden I actually, yeah, more work. Um, it, and if I didn't do it, um, I'm accountable to all the people when I show back up at that meeting um, of saying, well, did you follow through on this? I'll be like, no, nah, I didn't. Okay. So in order to be accountable, now I have extra work. Yeah, that's good. Good one. Sarah has being painfully aware, confronting your own privilege. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Who wants to do that? Yeah. 
Okay, this is good. This is great. Okay. Now, Steve, what do we do with all this information? Well, if we look at this, you know, before when you were talking about your your meeting and why people didn't show up after saying all these things, I think let me just turn this off for a second. Without that picture, mm -hmm. what's the answer? It's like they don't care, right? Or they're, you know, with the, those terrible things we were saying before, they're hypocrites, they don't actually care, they're not invested, um, they're not angry enough, they don't realize the scope and the scale of the problems, um, they want to be ignorant or they are ignorant. And so basically it's just categorizing, it's very easy not to say that you would always do this, but it's very easy to sort of um, categorize people that way, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And this can be harmful because we don't want to think of the people that we're trying to help and support and work with as essentially dumb and apathetic. Um, and without a tool like this, um, it's hard to make sense of it and hard to understand. Mm -hmm. Whereas when we have this, and we, you know, this could be more detailed and more specific to certain audiences, but it gives us a, at least a more complete picture of why someone might not show up and what, what we can do to help get them there, right? So instead of hoping that more of the population thought more like we already do, and we're on the right side, right? Like we're no pun intended, but we're doing the new behavior. So we see things more this way. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of expecting or hoping, wishing that people thought more like we did, I think it helps to understand how they're thinking so that we're better equipped to help and move them from the old behavior to the new behavior. Yeah, and I also think it has practical applications, which if, if you think about you're going to create a piece, like a creative piece, um, or you're going to approach people and come up with arguments for why you should come up to a, come to this meeting. It really helps to know what you're working against and also what you can work towards. And if you don't do this sort of work, that's just sort of a loose abstraction, right? But actually when you map these sort of things out, the first thing that came to my mind was, well, maybe you can build in, if people are worried about missing Netflix, right? After the meeting, we can all go to a movie, right? If people are worried about, you know, loss of family time, then set up, make sure that there's child care and that the kids can have a fun time and then have some, some like, family-ready thing right after it. That is, is once you acknowledge what's keeping people away. Yeah? Keep the meeting to that time, right? Yeah. Like, this is a thing that I think it's a pet peeve of Steve and mine where it's like, the meeting's supposed to be from 6 to 7, and when it goes to 7.15, like, not understanding that people have maybe really done a lot of work to make it happen so they could be there till 7. Right. Um, and so if your meetings end, start and end on time, people respect that, and it, it's helpful in, saw, in getting them there. Yeah, for sure. And that this helps us focus our appeals, whether they're creative artistic appeals or they're sort of rhetorical appeals. It gives real substance to the arguments we want to be able to make. And when these things come up, if you've thought about it before, you can speak to it. So if you start to get a hint that someone doesn't really want to deal with confronting their privilege or being in a meeting that um, where they feel like it's it becomes about them instead of the bigger purpose, it's like you can craft the meeting so that the things that happen need to happen, but it's like, no, we're not going to attack you. Like, we have this bigger purpose here. Um, and let them come into that realization on their own. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so this is a guide to thinking. And if it was easy as just like, okay, now we know the benefits, and now we know the costs, um, well, that would be fine. But it's not that easy, is it, Steve? No, ultimately we want to move, again, move people from the old behavior to the new behavior. So there's a really basic way to do this, um, and then there's some more nuanced ways. Um, but we're going to start with the basic way because it's, it's very easy. It's just very simple to understand, and it's probably familiar. So the idea is you minimize the benefits of the old behavior and you highlight the costs of the new be old behavior. And then with the new behavior, you highlight the benefits and minimize 
the costs. So the best example of this is in infomercials. Infomercials always start with telling you about the old way, and it's usually somebody in black and white, and they're telling you about how awful life is. And just to I have this great image of somebody unspooling a saran wrap, and they it falls out of the thing, and they get totally tangled, and it's a complete exaggeration of what it's like to use saran wrap, right? But they play this stuff up. And then they go into the new, this new thing, right? And they um, highlight all the benefits and they make sure they spell them out, put them on screen, and then they minimize the cost. It's like four easy payments of $19.95 um, to, to keep the number down and minimize the cost. So I have, I'm gonna paste a um, link to a YouTube video here. And what I want you all to do is just go and watch it. It's for the touch and brush. And look for how they highlight the costs and minimize or highlight the costs and minimize the benefits of the new behavior or the old behavior. You sweet. You roll. Yeah, and then and the reverse, and then just enter them into the chat, and we'll just give it. It's about two minutes, so you can do that now. And I'm going to turn off my mic and my camera, Steve. So I think that's been about two minutes. Um, so we've got uh, some answers coming in. And again, I just want you to look for these characteristics of playing up the costs of the, of the old behavior and highlighting the benefits of the new behavior and minimizing those costs, like just sort of that relationship. So um, oh, I see some laughter here. Okay, so uh, sorry, Steve. I, I was still watching it. Oh, okay, I, I, I am totally going to buy it, partly because. How do you clean your feet? You bend, stretch, and you can't. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Um, <laughs> because it is easy and cool to brush before school. You never thought about it. Yeah. Easy and cool. So, okay, so we're getting some responses in here. I, 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 this one has, you can watch any infomercial, I'll do this, but this one has some nice one. And, and um, Parker picked up on it right away, which is when they're showing you the old behavior, there's less color. Yeah. And then the new behavior is like, color enters your life, you know? And, and people are like smiling, they're happy. And it solved all sorts of other problems, like the kids actually going to school with their teeth brushed. Yeah, you know, it's like yeah, yeah. they get to school on time. It's amazing. <laughs> um, just to you know, the very last part, which of course is how you buy it, right? It does the classic infomercial sell, which is it's never twenty dollars, it's nineteen ninety five, or it's three easy payments of you know X amount of dollars. Um, I and didn't just get the extra brush. Yeah, you do get the extra. Adding things. to the benefits, right? Exactly. Um, there are some other ones here. Um, they stress how easy it is to use, right? Like, is it really hard to squeeze toothpaste onto your toothbrush? I've done it nearly every day for most of my life. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm actually pretty convinced. I, <laughs> I know. I watched it. And I'm like. Oh wow! I, could, I do kind of want this. Like you get about a minute and a half in, and you're like, "Well, maybe." And it actually gets all of it out of the pay, the toothpaste because I actually don't care 
about like the easiness, but I do care that I'm always wasting a little bit of toothpaste, right? Are you wasting? And this solves that problem. Dollars. Exactly. There you go. I don't. Um, yeah, so Steve, we have promised. We always promise people to actually get them out on time. Oh yeah. And, we and we're running towards the end here. Okay. Um, so let's skip to this sort of like, why are you showing us an infomercial, or rather, why are we showing them an infomercial? Because infomercials are the best. They are uh, the They're best cool. example yeah. of this. My preview just quit unexpectedly. Okay, so let me see if I can get this going again because I have more. To show. Oh, perfect. Okay, here we go. So this is one way, but we got to remember loss aversion too. So I'm going to tear through this. Um, when we're mapping out the old behavior and the new behavior, and this is why uh, infomercials are so extreme, right? Um, for someone looking at this who's doing the old behavior, the old behavior doesn't involve any loss or any gain. It's how they're doing it now. The new behavior has potential gain that they've never experienced and a risk of loss. But because of loss aversion, the potential gain gets minimized. The risk of loss looms larger, unreasonably larger, for the same reason that you experience, like not wanting to do that bet that mathematically is a good bet. And then the old behavior uh, seems pretty good. So the, the part of what we're saying here is that in order to get people to move from an old behavior to a new behavior, it takes a lot more work than seems reasonable. Right. Because people are always thinking more about what they have to lose than what they have to gain. Um, going right back to that bet that you played with people. People thought more about that $50 that they were going to lose other than the $150 people were going to actually win, even though there's obvious benefits there. And yeah. so we have to work harder in order to get people to change. Yeah. So that's one thing to know. And that's why these infomercials are so over the top. Now, it doesn't mean you have to, we're not saying you should make infomercials, but it's the best sort of uh, hyperbolic example of that. Um, the other Although, thing. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. An infomercial about, like, you know, getting rid of Trump? I mean, yeah. so, someone out there who's listening, run with that idea, please. When I teach my classes at Purchase, I'll often have students make in, like live action infomercials for social issues. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, okay, so ways to change minds and to change behavior. Um, these are some other things that we think you can extract from this lessons. Um, one is get a more complete picture of why people are doing what they're doing. That can be through interviews, that can be through through uh, sitting down with them. It can be your own uh, actually going through that process of the four by four or two by two chart. Um, but when you're working with a more complete picture, you're going to be more effective. The next one is um, I think it's useful to acknowledge the benefits of the old behavior. So yeah. not pretend that, yeah, you know, Netflix is great and it's going to be really comfy at your house. However, right? It, I think that makes you seem more human and more reasonable in what you're asking for. You can also build in some of those benefits of the old behavior into the new behavior, mm -hmm. such as having a movie night after the meeting, going out and doing something social. It can help give you ideas once you have that more complete picture. The other one is, is being sure to address the cost of the new behavior. Without this tool, I think what happens a lot is like, oh, you should do this, it's easy. It's going it's to be great. Don't worry about it. And, and smart people, which is most people, understand the cost. They're thinking of the cost. And if you don't address them, they're not going to trust you as much. And the final reason that this is so important goes back to what we started with at the beginning, which was my rant about my colleagues, um, which is, is we, by understanding people that we're trying to convince to do something different, we can also develop compassion for why they are the way they are um, and understand that they're not doing things that we don't think they should do because they're stupid, they're idiotic, they don't have class consciousness or what have you, but because there's real reasons. Um, they're perceived reasons. They may not be real, you know, genuine reasons, but people feel them. And by understanding why people aren't doing things, we can reach them more effectively, but we can also understand them and through that sort of understanding, have compassion, and through that sort of compassion, be much better at actually reaching people through our art, through our conversations, through our interchanges, what have you. Yeah. If you shut people down and they are idiots, there's no way you've already precluded 
the opportunity to actually reach them in any medium possible. Yeah. Except yelling, except yelling at them with a big poster. And um, I just want to say too, you mentioned this before, um, is that when you can alter the benefits and costs, that they're not always fixed, right? So like, how can you sweeten it? How can you make the benefits better? Once you understand and have compassion for these people, you can think of ways that you can change things to make it easier for them. Um, so, okay, let's keep going. So is there any, are the, right now is a great time to ask questions. Um, so please send those in and we'll answer what we can. In the meantime, we want to tell you about two things. One is that the next time, next, our next webinar, Steve is going to be doing with um, our board chair. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah sure. We um, are the, uh, our board chair is Patricia Gerrito, amazing all around activist organizer, now coach to um, activist organizers. And we first met her around a common love for popular culture and how we could learn from popular culture. Um, one of the ways to think about popular culture is it's, as it's a map to our popular desire. And by understanding our popular desire, we can actually speak to people where they are. Um, doesn't mean that we have to actually end up creating popular culture or wearing tights or doing, that's the superhero reference, but we do have to understand why people like popular culture in order to give them a sort of equivalent to it through our own actions, through our own activities, through our own projects and so on. So that's what uh, Patricia and I will be doing next week is working through some of the theory, looking at some examples, working with everybody else on the webinar about what we can learn from pop culture. We've got some good ones including Fast and Furious 6. Oh, man. And, we've, and got, we've got the link for um, you to register for that webinar in the chat. So if you want to just click on that, you can register now. That's all set to go. Um, I'm not going to be there because I'm going to be at the College Art Association Conference, which I don't necessarily recommend. But if you're going anyway, <laughs> um, I'm going to be there. It's in New York City uh, at some hotel. And then we'll be in the Petit Trianon room. Um, on Friday from 1.30 to 3.30. So uh, I'm going to be doing a panel with Liz Grady from A Blade of Grass and with uh, uh, Blake Stimson, and we're going to be talking about uh, assessing the impact of socially engaged art in this kind of work. So if you're already there, come. Don't go out of your way. Um, oh, come on. You can go out of your way because you can see, actually, Steve, at the College Art Association and we record all of these, and so you can come back and view a recording of them. Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. And how do people get to our recordings, Steve? Um, yeah, so the recording will go up. Um, one last thing, if you want to keep these free, uh, your donations help do that. So I'm putting a link in the chat to donate. Um, and we got a question from Casey. Um, oh, first one was from, oh, I, uh, I don't want to. I'm not going to try to pronounce your name. Zodeco. Was this recorded? <laughs> and I missed yes, the first part. I will post it. Um, the next one, a question from Casey. If I have a lot of friends who are way, way too aggressive towards people who don't immediately respond to their request to change, get active, etc. How can I help them understand why people that don't join a movement aren't necessarily bad people? That's a great question. Yeah. Uh, I think we would suggest uh, sitting down with them and say, doing a cost-benefit analysis <laughs> and getting them to think rationally about why people don't do what they want. And there's something wonderful about that in so far as by examining other people, you start to examine your own ideas and your own prejudices. I, the thing I do is I'll talk about myself and say, well, you know, I don't go to every meeting and a lot of times this or this is happening. or, And I'll, I'll try to give reasons that sort of soften that picture and I could say I could imagine this other person wouldn't come or might also have something like that going on and then if they keep going say well if you really care maybe we could work on this and um, and this gives that some structure and I think it's hard to walk away from it um, having that same aggressive attitude right and I think a very important part of this we always like to say is some people you can't organize around. They basically are unreachable. But we have to be able to reach 51% of the people in a democracy in order to get anything done. Um, and so whether you like those people or not, whether you approve of them or not, we have to figure out how to reach 
a large swath of the population if we're going to bring about democratic social change. Yeah. Um, all right. That was a great question. And we are um, close to our end. So um, thank you for your uh, time and attention to this. And we really appreciate the enthusiasm for these. We have, they'll be going every Friday uh, for the next few weeks. We have them planned out. And uh, I think that's it. Steve, you got anything else to say? Uh, just come on back and tell your friends and uh, spread the word and go out and do stuff. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you. See you uh, next week. <laughs>